Oh, well, thank, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to come and, and visit. It's, uh, Chin says, I, or Professor Fang says, I, I'm, I'm one of you, or one of some of you, I guess. So that's me, that's my grad photo from 98. So my hair has gone a bit gray and my glasses are different, but you'll agree that's that's the same guy. Uh, I did uh, anesthesia management. I never really used the management stuff after I graduated. But I did use a lot of it. <laughs> And Fizz part, which I'm, I'm happy to say was very good preparation for what I plan on doing. I, I did um, a lot of the optics electives when I was here. Um, at the time, I thought I wanted to get into telecommunications. Um, and after I graduated, I went to IBM Global Services. I did um, network uh, planning. I lasted about a year doing that. Uh, I really, it just, it wasn't for me. So I went back to grad school at Toronto. <laughs> Um, and I got interested in the idea of some of the things I learned about optics, applying it to medicine, biomedical applications, so basic research in, in medicine. Um, and when I graduated, Chin stole my first, first slide. That's I went, after I, I graduated, I went down to Boston to Harvard Medical School, and I worked in the radiology department, uh, and using light to try to do imaging. Uh, and in 2008, I got a job at Northeastern University. If you haven't heard of Northeastern, it's in Boston. Um, if you picked up Northeastern and dropped it in any other, I'd like to say, dropped it in any other city in the States, other than Boston, it would be far and away the biggest research university. Uh, in Boston, there's a couple other schools <laughs> across the river in Cambridge that tend to overshadow us, but it is a large engineering uh, research school. So, so yeah, I, I work in, in bio-optics, and um, I, I think you can divide it into sort of diagnostics and therapeutics. I started in therapeutics, so like trying to treat cancer, and then I, as I went along, I got more interested in diagnostics. So I think light, visible light, has a lot of interesting properties. Um, visible photons have a couple of electron volts of energy. Sorry, by the way, what, what is, um, are most people here sort of undergrad? Like, who's, who's undergrad here? OK. <laughs> and a few grad students. A few grad students. OK, so I, I have a couple of intro slides in bio-optics. So, uh, the graduates can tune out for five minutes, and then I'll, I'll get into kind of the, the research. But so you know, elect, uh, visible photons have a few electron volts of energy, so it allows you to probe the molecular composition of tissue. So it can move electrons around, but not enough energy to knock them out, not enough energy to ionize. So it's very safe. I can sit here with my laser pointer like this all day. I'll never cause any any health uh, effects unless I really turn up. Uh, so you have this ability to probe tissue in a safe uh, way. And there's different kinds of contrast uh, that we can get. So you can, can broadly break it up into intrinsic, so that <coughs> contrast that's already there. Okay? So if you shoot light into tissue and analyze what comes out, you can learn about the absorption properties um, and the scatter properties. So things like blood, for example, have differential absorption, so you can look at it. Uh, blood vessel formation, hypermetabolism, scatter tells you about the composition of the tissue, um, size of scatters, scatters, the arrangement of scatters. So you can learn a lot just by looking at the native uh, contrast of the tissue. Um, I tend to work in something called extrinsic um, contrast, which is the idea of injecting something or using some external contrast agent to give you contrast against a specific molecule that you might be interested in. Okay, so fluorescence is kind of the main one. What's a, what's, what's a fluorescent molecule? Silence. Somebody knows what a fluorescent molecule is. Yes? One that emits light. Or after you, radiation. yes, that's half of it. So, so you hit it with a photon, or you hit it with light, and then it absorbs that light and re-emits at a longer wavelength. So you can use fluorescence to give you contrast you can target it against a molecule that might be associated with cancer, for example, that you might be uh, interested in. So, all right, um, and and from that, you know, people have used bioptics to do imaging on a lot of different scales, all the way down from to the certain the general uh, chart, which I'm not going to go through all of it. But you know, if you look at small levels of microscopy. Uh, you can get really high resolution images, but you can also image at larger scales, right up to animals and even humans. <coughs> um, right up to kind of you know, tens of centimeters in distance. 
Um, one of the sort of features of imaging of light and tissue is resolution. So at these lower scales, um, you get very high resolution microscopy, you get a beautiful resolution, but as you go up, uh, you get a lot of light scatter. And that really impacts your ability to do high resolution imaging. But you can still, as I say, probe tissue for a kind of you know, the, the constituents and, and the molecular uh, composition. So for the, you know, for the optics people, so at, at these smaller scales and microscopy scales, um, it's usually useful to think of light as being a wave or a ray. Okay. Um, but as you go bigger, uh, it's actually more useful to think of light as being a particle, so a chargeless, massless particle bouncing around uh, in the tissue. Um, so, another sort of Mac and Fizz thing. When I was here, I did a lot of these um, <coughs> nuclear engineering courses uh, as electives, which I thought I'd never use again. But it turns out the math for how photons move in biological tissue is actually very, very similar to the way that neutrons move around in a nuclear reactor. So, the Boltzmann transport equation, uh, the diffusion approximation, boundary equations. I don't know if you've got there yet, but when you do, all that stuff turns out is actually really, really useful for understanding uh, the math of, of light transport. So, turns out I, I thought I'd never use it, but I, I use it like all the time. I still have the textbook on my desk, and I use it quite, quite a lot. So, all right, at microscopic scales, a lot of people think, oh, you're trying to image with light. You know, tissue's opaque. How, how can you possibly do that? But that, that's actually not true. Light uh, tissue is not opaque at all. Um, in fact, if you shoot red light into tissue, uh, it will actually go on average about 10 centimeters before it gets absorbed. So a red photon can go 10 centimeters before it gets uh, absorbed. But it's actually a diffusive material. So the scatter uh, pack length is only about 100 micrometers. So it scatters much more uh, than it absorbs. Uh, you know what that is? It's like an H test. One of these days I'm going to show that, and people aren't going to know what I'm talking about. But you know, if you take a laser pointer and shine it at your finger, it glows, right? And that's because of this scatter effect. But if I take a green light, this is my next slide, if I take green light, that doesn't happen. So everything that I just said is highly dependent on the wavelength. Okay, so at lower, this is the spectra, visible is in here. So if you lower wavelengths, um, you've got proteins, you've got blood that absorb a lot. At higher wavelengths, you've got water. So you have this middle optical window, which is sort of red and near infrared light, where light uh, photons will actually go pretty far. Okay, so this becomes important for macroscopic uh, images. So when you're a kid at camp, you take a flashlight and you shine it through your hand, what comes out the other side? <laughs> red light, right? Okay, so that, that's, and we used to say, oh, it's because of blood. It's kind of true, but it's, it's actually, this is the reason, actually. So, so the green and blue photons are getting absorbed, and what's getting out is the red light. So this is a very large effect. So anytime you're trying to do brain imaging, or let's say breast imaging, or, or even mouse imaging at larger scales, you really need to be working in this infrared uh, red uh, window. Okay, so that's, that's kind of my, my preamble about bio-optics. Hopefully that was useful for uh, you know, some, of, some of the people earlier on in your education. And, there's a lot of work here at Mac, by the way. I'm, I'm sure you know Professor Fang is doing biomedical optics, Tom Farrell, John Hayward, uh, Mike Patterson until recently. It's actually, a lot of the kind of seminal papers in bio-optics came from Mac, actually. So this is actually an epicenter of bio-optics, yeah, believe it or not. So anyway, uh, so I, we, we work on a number of projects in my lab, but I thought I'd focus on one today, which I've sort of recently worked on, which I'm, I'm kind of um, more and more excited about it, so something I want to talk about. It's called Toward Rare Cell Rebuild Flow Cytometry. So hopefully by the end of my talk that will make complete sense, but this is funded in the States, uh, the National Institute of Health, which is the, the health agency, and some state funding from Massachusetts, which is where uh, we live. Um, so, so let me just start by, and I'm going to get bio here for five minutes, I apologize, but I'll come back to the, the optics. Um, but th there are a lot of, of, of applications in medicine and biology where you're interested in cells that are moving around in the bloodstream, they're called circulating cells. Um, a lot of applications, one that's got a lot of attention in the last sort of five years are what are called circulating tumor cells, or CTCs. 
Um, and the reason people are, are interested in that is because they're involved in metastasis, so cancer metastasis. So unfortunately in cancer, and a lot of the work I do is related to cancer, unfortunately in cancer, it, it, it usually isn't the primary, the first site of the tumor that is deadly. It's actually the spread to distant sites in the body, which is difficult to control and ultimately is, is what's responsible um, for the death of the person, unfortunately. So one of the mechanisms people understand is that it starts at uh, a primary tumor, so the primary site, um, and then it grows to a certain point where it starts getting into the blood uh, vessels and then moving through the vasculature to a different site in the body. Um, and then at some point they'll let it invade and then form a secondary site. And that's what's actually very, very deadly. By the way, I didn't know anything about biology after I finished my undergrad. I, I learned all of this in, in post-graduate uh, education. So, um, you know, people are really interested in these, these cells. What, you know, what are they doing? It turns out there is, this is, this is called prognostic um, value of CTCs. So this is a curve from uh, a paper in Lancet Oncology a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't know if you've seen one of these. It's called the Kaplan-Meier survival curve. So this is overall survival. Uh, versus time after diagnosis. Okay, so this is a pooled analysis of almost 2,000 uh, breast cancer patients at 17 breast cancer centers uh, in Europe. And what, what this curve says is how long after, what fraction of people are surviving after diagnosis. Okay, so you want this as flat as possible. Flatter it is at 100% means everybody's surviving. That's, that's what you want. Okay, so there's two groups of people here, and this is only a couple of years old. There's two groups of people here. So blue are what is called CTC negative, circulating tumor cell negative. So what that means is at the time of diagnosis, they draw a blood sample, um, and then they count it with a test called uh, cell search. So they draw seven and a half milliliters of blood, uh, and if there are fewer than five cells in that sample, the person is CTC negative. If there's five or more in that sample, CTC positive. So blue is CTC negative, red is CTC positive. So what that's saying is that if, unfortunately, at the time of diagnosis, the person is CTC positive, uh, their survival is much worse. So it's prognostic for poor uh, overall survival, okay? Um, and not only that, um, it actually tells you something about whether or not your treatment is working. So if you take a second blood sample six weeks after treatment has started, Okay, so there's four curves here. So green is negative at the time of diagnosis, negative after you start treatment, so that's the best one. Red is positive at the time of diagnosis, positive after you start treatment. But so interestingly, blue is positive at the time of diagnosis and then negative after you start treatment. Right? And it's closer to the green curve. So what it's saying is, is that your treatment's working, it's doing something. And then pink is the opposite, negative at the time of diagnosis, positive as you, after treatment. So it's, the treatment isn't working. Okay, so not only is it telling you prognostic, it's telling you something about whether or not your treatment uh, is effective. So in bio-optics, we are constantly looking for prognostic biomarkers, things that'll tell you something about how treatment's going, right? Uh, and so you'll agree that this is a very good one. Um, and then the second thing is that these are really rare, and this is what, where the engineering challenge kind of comes in, is that you'll notice seven and a half milliliters, the threshold is five cells. So the threshold is actually less than one cell per milliliter. So it's a very rare event. Um, a very small number of these things can be clinically very significant. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what got me interested in, in this problem. That's the clinical um, uh, perspective, but there's also the small animal uh, preclinical. Like a lot of people think clinically, but there's a lot of research, places like MAC, basically any research university or pharmaceutical company where they're looking at animal models, mice models, um, because we still don't really understand metastasis, and there's still a lot of basic work that people want to do. So things like, why does this happen? When does this happen? Um, why do some of the, most of these actually don't form metastasis, but a small fraction do, so why, it's called metastatic potential, so why is that? What are, what are some of the molecular properties of those cells that allow them to do that? Um, can you use this data to tell you how to treat, so which drug to use, not just whether or not your drug is working, so that's predictive versus prognostic. 
Uh, you want to test new therapies. And people will test these things in small animals long before anybody thinks about trying it um, in a person. So clinical is important, but preclinical small animal stuff is also um, very, very important. Um, and, and there's a lot of other examples in other kinds of biology, but I'm sort of focusing on CTC is cancer for a, for a perspective. All right, so what do biologists do? I'm coming back to the optics in a minute. So what do biologists do? So what they do is they take a blood sample, about 100 micrometers, uh, and then they do some analysis with it. There's <coughs> tools like flow cytometry and these microfluidic devices. Good lab might have a cell search. That's the clinical uh, FDA approved system that you can buy. But they all have this kind of thing in common is that you have to take blood out. Right? And that is actually not good. People have shown in a lot of studies that just taking the blood out, putting it on ice, storing it, handling it, enriching it can all cause troubles, cause artifacts with the number of cells that you eventually see. So this is, this is actually uh, problematic. The other thing is you, you can only draw about 50 or 100 microliters of blood. You can only do that once uh, per day. So if you're looking for changes, you might be giving a treatment, you might want to see changes that might happen over a few minutes, you simply can't. Uh, do that. Um, and then sensitivity um, it, I, it amounts to a few milliliters of blood. Um, you're only drawing 100 microliters of blood. So if you're looking for rare cells, you simply can't pick it up. So unfortunately, what people have to do is uh, euthanize the mouse, to drain out all the blood, and then count the whole blood. So that's bad for the mouse, obviously, but it's also bad for the science because you can't follow the same mouse. Over time, metastasis is something that only happens in vivo, right? You can't study it in cell culture. It is inherently an in vivo uh, process. So, all right, I'm back to the topic. So, what about us? What can can we do to uh, address this? So, uh, 2004, people developed this technique called in vivo flow cytometry. So, the idea is that you get away from having to draw a blood sample uh, at all. So, this is basically a modified microscope. This is developed in Charles Lane's group at Harvard. I worked for him for a time, so it kind of triggered my interest in this. But essentially what you do is you take a microscope, and you look, this is in the ear, so the ear of a mouse is very, very thin. It's only a few hundred microns thick. And you shine a laser slit across uh, a blood vessel, a little arterial in the ear, and then as cells, so you have to label the cells. This is a preclinical um, experiment. Again, this mice, you have to label the cells with the fluorophore, uh, and then as they pass through the slit, you get a little blip of fluorescence. So these PMTs, where the PMTs are here, um, you get a spike. So you can count those spikes. Um, so this is a way to enumerate, count the circulating cells directly in vivo. And people have used this, it's, it's kind of a simple idea, but people have used this for a lot of different you know, red blood cells, cancer types, immunology, a lot of people in the last 10 years or so have kind of developed new technology on this, uh, including my group at, at uh, Northeastern. But what it comes down to, and, and this is the point, is the sensitivity is a limitation. Um, the blood flow in here is very, very small. You only get a microliter or so of blood flowing in there per minute. Okay, so a mouse has got several milliliters of blood. Um, so even if you sit there for an hour acquiring data, you're only sampling 60 microliters of blood. So if you're looking for a rare cell population, you're just not going to see it. So you can argue about the lower level of sensitivity, but it's something like 1,000 cells per milliliter um, in the blood. Now, that's fine for a lot of applications, but the stuff we're talking about, where it's a few cells per milliliter, it's just simply not, not sufficient. So the question is, can we do any better? Can we improve on this? And so that's kind of what one of the products that, that I work on. So, um, okay, computer vision and vivo flow cytometry. So, I'll start with that. So, the idea is this. So, if the problem is uh, the blood flow rate is very poor uh, in a blood vessel, uh, why don't we just zoom out? Why don't we just try to like look at a larger region uh, of the mouse here? Uh, and so, we'll sample more blood. Uh, and hopefully increase the detection sensitivity. So this is an instrument that we built to do it. It's, it's a pretty simple system. There's a laser here. You shoot, the mouse sits on the stage here, so you light up basically the whole ear. This is five by five milliliters, so it's most of the ear of the 
of the mouse, and then you measure <coughs> the fluorescent light being uh, emitted. Uh, here's very small. It's, it's only a few hundred micrometers uh, thick. Uh, and so you get sort of 15 or 20 microliters, so an order of magnitude more blood flowing uh, per minute. That might seem obvious. Uh, what's the problem with that? The problem is you get images that look like this. It's, it's a rather uh, poor image. Um, the reason is the cell is very small. It's only a few micrometers across. Uh, this is a five by five millimeter image. So one cell is like one pixel. You get a lot of noise, you get a lot of backgrounds. So you get very lousy images. So that little blip there is a cell. And if I told you that's a cell, you probably wouldn't believe me, but that happens to be a cell. So this is a mouse where we've injected multiple myeloma cells so, uh, but it's really hard what I'm trying to say. If you look at one image, you kind of make any sense of it. But, but, and I'll show you in a second in video, but if you look at a sequence, actually you can see it quite nicely. So this is kind of a moving target moving along, and you can look at it and stitch it into uh, a track. So, well, that's not good. Let's see. Microsoft behaving. Ah, there we go. So even though you, you saw it go by, even though it's a super noisy image, um, your brain is really good at this, detecting connect. So picking up the moving thing, our, our brains are really good at, at uh, doing this. Um, so uh, you can make a grad student sit there and stare at video like this for an hour. Uh, that's not very nice. You will see one cell every two, three minutes So when you at these concentrations. Um, so you'd really like to kind of automate this uh, and be a little smarter uh, about it. So we teamed up with people who do computer vision in the uh, electrical engineering department, and we developed an algorithm for this. Uh, there's kind of a lot of nitty gritty in the image processing, but, but basically it's a two-step. We take a video or an image sequence. Uh, we look for bright things, your cell candidates. Okay, so on any particular image, we look for bright things, um, and then the, the trickier part is step two is trajectory merging. So then we look over time how these bright things are moving. They have to move in sort of a coherent uh, trajectory in a way that cell can, can physically uh, uh, move. Uh, and from this kind of, it's called motion uh, filtering, we can actually pick out uh, moving cells. So this is some data from that. Again, these things are very rare. You can do it manually, but it's, it's nice to have it automated. But See, here's a slow moving guy, that's the track. Uh, here's another one where there's two in the same image. There's a quick one, this one is on uh, So it, it works pretty well. They normally work on like threat detection for terrorism, but it's actually kind of something different for them. But anyway, so um, <coughs> this is the boring slide, but, but basically we can trade off sensitivity and, and false alarm rate. So you can tune the algorithm. Um, so basically, if you want to pick up more cells, you're going to you can tweak it, but you're going to pay the price of more false alarms uh, over time. Um, and the other kind of critical thing is dynamics. So that second step, so if you just look for bright spots, it doesn't work. So you really need to look at how things are moving over time. You really need that dynamic step. It actually cuts out about 99% um, of your false alarms. Uh, if you're interested, we published a few papers on, on that idea. So, okay. Um, any questions? Anybody still with me? Okay. So uh, let, let me move on to a different technique: diffuse fluorescence flow cytometry, which is another thing uh, that we're the other area of work in my group, which I'm not talking about today, is um, uh, fluorescence imaging. We're actually trying to image whole animals, and so. We shoot a laser through a mouse, and we look at the light that comes out the other side, and we try to reconstruct the fluorescent position um, inside that. So this is called diffuse fluorescence imaging, diffuse fluorescence tomography. So we do a lot of this stuff in my group. This is an example of X-ray um, CT, uh, sorry, uh, lung tumor in the lung. That's an X-ray, and this is a fluorescence imaging. So we have a lot of background in this kind of diffuse optics, this macro optics. So we've got an interesting idea is can we apply this type of uh, technology, diffuse technology, diffuse optics technology, to this problem of rare cell uh, detection? So question is, can we put these things to, together? So is it possible to find one cell in an entire mass, one fluorescent labeled cell, entire mass? 
No, absolutely not. You certainly cannot do that. There's no way. This is a tumor which is, you know, a few billion cells. There's no way you'll actually be able to pick up an individual cell. And the reason is, is the signal from one cell um, is extremely weak, um, and you get significant background tissue outputs. You just wouldn't be able to, to pick it up. But, but um, for those of you who've never considered the anatomy of a mouse, this is a new mouse, by the way, that's red to have more hair. Uh, it has a suppressed immune system, which causes it to have no hair. But anyway, um, there, there are parts on a mouse that are very small. It's only a couple millimeters in diameter. So for example, the tail. Um, but you actually get a lot of blood flow, about a few hundred microliters of blood per minute flows through the tail of a mouse. So in principle, if you could sample everything going through the tail, uh, you could sample the entire blood volume in sort of a few minutes. So we had this idea and uh, we, we thought, well, what if we made some kind of like cuff that would go around the limb or the, the tail uh, of a mouse? You have lasers hitting it. Um, and then detectors on the other side, and as the cell ran through here, we could pick up a spike um, and maybe try to uh, see a cell. So the idea is not we're trying to image the whole mouse. What we're looking for is a, a short kind of blip as a cell moves through uh, the field of view. Uh, and the government gave us money to try to do that. We, we spent a couple of years on this. This is the eventual instrument that we, we built. It's still a ring. Um, so there's six detectors, there's two lasers, that's the diagram there. So the limb of the mouse would go in there. Um, so these alternate, and then we pick up the signal on a PMT array here, uh, and we process it with, with electronics. Um, as I was saying at the start, we're working in the red, the infrared here, again, to try to get as much light penetration um, as we can get. Um, before we, we, we touched the mouse, we, we did a lot of um, testing of this with a, a phantom model. So this is like, it, it, it doesn't look like light, but it's actually a, a piece of, of material that has the same optical properties, about the same size as the limb of a mouse. And what we can do is run cells and microspheres through it at known concentrations, known intensities, and verify that it's working. <coughs> so uh, this is the kind of data that you get. So six detectors, one, three, four, five, six. This is time on this axis. And then what you see is, as a sphere runs through it, you get a spike. Right? And so you can count those. So it's similar to the other uh, techniques. So you can tell just by looking at this that it, it was probably closest to that fifth detector. right? The signal's brightest on the fifth detector, so it's probably closest here. So you can actually kind of triangulate. As well as count them, you actually kind of triangulate where the cell was in, in the cross-section. Um, we did a lot of this, so I won't bore you with the nitty gritty details, but we looked at different concentrations, different optical properties, different kinds of cells, uh, and we convinced ourselves that, yeah, this, this could work. This is, uh, this, is, this is a feasible thing, so. All right, um, so this, this is a people now. We flipped up uh, the, the instrument vertically. Um, this is a mouse, and we inject the mouse with multiple myeloma cells that are fluorescently labeled. Um, and we put the tail in the middle of that thing. Um, and so this is a mouse where we're injecting cells that have not been labeled. So you inject, and then you see not much. Um, and then when you inject cells that have been fluorescently labeled, 10 to the 5, you actually see uh, these spikes here. So control, you see that. Uh, injected, uh, you see that. The signal's not great. I'll return to that. But it did show. The idea could work. You can see these spikes. You can count these spikes. Uh, they do track with what's actually happening. Um, uh, and, and so even though we're kind of over where we we're shooting for, this kind of showed that this idea had potential that we could actually uh, potentially uh, do this. Um, tomography, uh, this, this is kind of a, a secondary thing. But when you have an instrument like this, you sort of expose yourself to an overcounting artifact. And the issue is that, so uh, a tail has arteries and veins. So arteries go out and, and veins go back up. So if you're just counting anything that runs through um, the ring, basically you'll count it once on the way out and then 
again as it, as it comes back. So what you'd really like to do is know where the thing is, not just how many spikes there are, but where uh, the spike is. So ideally, we'd be able to count how many cells, for example, are just in the artery, so that we know that they're all going in, in one direction. Uh, and that's why uh, the instrument might look a little strange, but we have two lasers and six detectors. These flash. Um, and so we actually get 12 measurements. So every spike, we actually get 12 looks at it um, at, at 10 hertz, so 10 times a uh, second. So we can use that. This is called tomography. So that's stuff I was talking about, but you can actually localize roughly where the cell was uh, in the cross section. So this is from a different experiment, but <laughs> same idea. So this is before injection. Post injection. So if you take any one of these spikes and you construct it, you can kind of see where it wound up. So this is the tail. This is vein, 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 artery. Um, and most of these things, when you construct them, they wind up uh, on kind of the position of where those veins and, and arteries are. So it's a way to kind of figure out where these things actually are in a rough way. Uh, once in a while, they come off. They kind of there's blood vessels everywhere, but most of the time. They're these, these larger um, blood vessels. Uh, we can even do a little better than that. Uh, this is kind of technical. Maybe I should skip this. But, but basically, we're, we're, we're sort of solving this like an image, but we have some a priori information here. We know the cell is very, very small. So we know that this is not possible. It can't be a blurred spot. It has to be a point spot. So we can actually constrain our inverse solution. So the grad students, maybe. Um, so instead of assuming a general solution, we can impose sparsity on our solution. We know it has to be a point target. So in other words, we take our measurement and say, if it's a point, what is the most likely point uh, that actually came, came from? So this is called the maximum likelihood estimation theory. So basically, if you do that, you do much, much better. And you can actually hit the bullseye. This is a phantom that you can actually hit the bullseye like, like every time. So, Anyway, so we can detect cells, we can count the cells, and we can actually localize them uh, in detail. <coughs> All right, so that's kind of where we were about a year ago. But there were some um, sort of open challenges uh, and open questions. Um, so one is what I kind of hinted at. The SNR view was actually, if we're honest, uh, pretty bad. So the spikes here, these big ones, yeah, I believe those are spikes. But if you look at the control mice, you still get a lot of kind of Things like that. And if you look at the signal to noise ratio here, it's actually only about 15 dB. So it's actually 5 to 1. The spike is about 5 times more than the noise, which is not good for a detection problem on average. So that was kind of an open issue. Um, the other thing is, what we don't know um, is we're injecting cells. Um, how many cells are actually in? Circulation. So we know there's a small fraction. We know we inject a bunch of cells. They're almost all cleared out uh, instantly. Um, but the question is, we don't really know how many are actually there. So we don't really know how sensitive this thing uh, really is. Uh, and then, you know, just stepping back a bit, thinking about trying to do this in a person or even a larger animal, um, the scalability is bad. If you look at this kind of system, there is nowhere on a human that this thing as the ear of a mouse, like two, three hundred micrometers across. There's nowhere in a human that that's small. But not even I know of anyway. And even the tail of a mouse is only a few millimeters across. Maybe your earlobe, but generally this is very not scalable. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, we're sort of want to work with biologists, so this is sort of a complicated uh, design. So we really wanted to kind of simplify this. So that's where we were about a year ago. But in the meantime, this whole idea of circulating tumor cells got really hot. Uh, and so we got more money from the government to develop it. You know, they liked the idea enough that they, they gave us more money to kind of develop it further. So we got what's called an R01, which is like a five year, million and a half dollar grant. Uh, not just me, it's with collaborators at Harvard Med School. So Charles Lynn and Irene Gobriel is a medical doctor who specializes in multiple myeloma disease, which I'll, I'll come back to. In a second, but to develop this further and kind of apply it to some, some interesting biology. So right now, in the last kind of year, we're actually experimenting with new designs. This is one of the designs, but you know, bearing in mind this, we want to improve that and we want to make it kind of more usable. We thought, let, let's toss away all the open optics and just try to use a fiber bundle, uh, which is some of the stuff that you actually do. But basically, we had this custom-made uh, 
fiber bundle, it's eight detector fibers and one excitation fiber, and basically a couple of laser in, it hits the tissue, uh, and then we couple the light to, in this case, just one detector from these uh, detection fibers. Um, we have put the filters right on the surface. There's a lot of kind of interference from the fibers and from the tissue, so we put the filters directly on the surface. So it's kind of a complicated probe, but it's, it looks pretty simple when you, when you see it. Uh, so that's the instrument, but, but that's a probe right there. So it's basically just a metal probe that you just put right uh, on the surface uh, of the tissue. Um, all right, so this is where we are now as of actually this summer. Um, basically, mouse, again, it's a new mouse, uh, but you just put it like, right on the artery. On the tail, and so this is a control mouse now, um, and so it's it's basically perfectly flat. Um, why is it perfectly flat? Uh, one thing which it's kind of embarrassing; it took us four years to realize this. But uh, if you go back to this, you know the tail is kind of suspended in the air, and it can sort of move around and get these motion artifacts. Um, you can get rid of most of that just by holding it down and putting the fiber firmly against it. So it, it's, <laughs> so it's actually like way more stable than ever was. The other thing is that we're, we're, we're collecting from a smaller volume of, of, of light. So we're collecting just from the blood vessels. So it's just a much cleaner uh, signal. And then when you inject cells, you get these, these much cleaner both um, spikes, which are much more, more evident. Uh, so if you look at the SNR, uh, 20 log, signal to my button noise, we're actually getting an extra 15 dB just by doing this. So we've gone from 15 to like about 30 dB uh, on average. So we've really cleaned up the signal uh, by doing this. So it's pretty significant gain. We're reviewing that now. Uh, and then the second part of that is um, how, how sensitive is this, this thing really? Um, and so this experiment, this is in progress. This is not even in submission yet, but basically what we do is we inject um, 100,000 cells, we wait about 10 minutes, uh, and then we start collection. Uh, the reason we do that is we know that as you inject cells, basically they go everywhere, and then they get cleared out of circulation almost instantly in the liver, the heart, the lungs, the site of injection. They get cleared out very, very quickly in the first kind of couple minutes as they just, the first couple passes around the circulatory system. And then after about 10 minutes, it reaches kind of a quasi-stable, um, you know, it still decreases, but you still see cells for hours and even days. So this drop, we don't know exactly, but it's, it's much, much less than 1%. It's sort of like a fraction uh, of a percent. So we basically did that, waited to get to this quasi-stable regime. Then we take data for 15 minutes. Then we draw blood out of the animal. Uh, and then we count it with a secondary instrument, a flow cytometer. Okay, so we're counting, and then we're comparing it to how many cells were actually in the blood. And so this is kind of, this is in progress, but cell counts in 15 minutes, uh, cells per milliliter of blood. So um, one of the problems is this is a really hard x-axis to get, but actually we get a pretty nice um, positive correlation. It's fairly linear. Um, but we're actually down to about a few cells per milliliter now, uh, per milliliter per hour. Acquisition. It's not quite where we want to be. Uh, we want to be probably another factor of three or four better than this. I'd like to get this kind of sensitivity in about 15, 10, 15 minutes, but we're, we're, we're getting there. It's, it's really kind of coming along nicely. So anyway, uh, so that's, that's kind of where we are. Um, but we are, we are definitely in the ballpark. All right, so uh, that's ongoing. We're, we're just in the first year of a five-year project on that. Um, 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 but, but if you compare this to what everybody else does, which this is kind of a microscope system, we, we certainly are getting about two orders of magnitude better sampling. So uh, this would be about 1,000 cells per milliliter. We're, we're down a couple orders of magnitude. So we're much more sensitive to other um, techniques. And then the other thing I like about it in China is I'm trying to collaborate with biologists and cancer researchers, is it's just a lot simpler to kind of implement these, do that, at least from the user uh, side of thing. 
Um, we think we're, we're not sure, but we think that we're a little bit lower detection sensitivity in terms of not just the counting, but the brightness of the cell. So how bright a cell can we actually detect? That's something we're, we're still working on. Um, but again, this is um, an ongoing <coughs> area of development. OK, so why are we doing this again? The, the, I like to play with the lasers. It's a lot of fun. But why are we doing this again? Um, so this grant is actually working on a disease called multiple myeloma, which is, is a, unfortunately a very uh, difficult disease. Um, it, it's a type of cancer that it's, it's an incurable blood malignancy. Um, it presents clinically as multiple bone lesions. A lot of times people who have multiple myeloma, um, they, you know, they sort of, they, they feel like pain in their bones. And they might, maybe they think it's arthritis or something. But often it's actually that there's this cancerous lesions all over. This is in the leg. Uh, this is in the skull. And it's got not a great five-year survival. Um, and the way people think it works is it starts at a single site. Minutes, okay, I'll speed up. It starts at a single site and then disseminates via the vasculature. So it's a lot like um, metastasis. And when you treat, frequently you get a really good response right away, but it always comes back, unfortunately, at some point. Uh, and this is an animal model of that. But basically, the treat, it looks like it's gone. Um, and then at some point, it comes back. And the, the thinking, the, the theory of this is something called minimal residual disease. And it's not just multiple myeloma. Many types of cancers you see this. So there's a few cells sort of hiding out um, in, the, in, the, in the bone marrow. And at some point, for some reason, they decide to enter into the circulation and reproliferate. OK? Uh, and that's called MRD. And so it, this, this is, is critical for curing, right? This is what people are really after in the last uh, couple of years. So it's, by definition, you're talking about a few cells in a mouse, for example, a handful, probably less than 10 in the entire mouse, is by definition difficult to detect and study. So uh, that's what we're trying to do. And Irene Bobrell is an expert in multiple myeloma, and she has a lot of questions on this. Things like, how many are there? Nobody knows. When do they come out of circulation and proliferate? Nobody knows. Um, better yet, how do we get them out of the bone marrow niche where we can kill them? In circulation, it's called mobilization therapy. Are there specific subpopulations uh, that are resistant to that, um, and so on? So there's a lot of questions, and so years one, and two, and three are sort of developing the instrument, but we're, we're hopeful that we can get fairly soon to doing these kinds of studies. Uh, and the last okay, I'm going to stop. But would this work in humans? Uh, I've gotten this question enough times, but I now have a slide on it. Would it work in humans? Could I do this in a person? Which is kind of it's an interesting to think about. I used to say no, we're only doing this in mice, but I've actually talked to a few medical doctors, and it's like they kind of think, well, uh, maybe, maybe you could do this. And the answer now I say is maybe. Um, optically, yeah, it actually makes sense. If you look at something like your forearm, there is a lot of superficial blood vessels, or even just in kind of your wrist, they're actually right at the surface, and they actually carry uh, quite uh, a lot of blood. So you can imagine probe like the one that we're using that you can just put on the surface and try to detect uh, the tumor cells. And the challenge, though, is labeling the cells that you're interested in. All the studies I've been talking about, we pre-label the cells. We're working in mice, so we can label them however we want. If you're talking about a person, you have to inject a probe. Uh, and there's a lot of people working on this problem, but you have to inject a probe that's targeted to some molecule on the cell that you want. So it could be a surface receptor that's associated with cancer. Uh, but you have to inject something that's, that's associated with that probe. So that is a problem. But a lot of people are actually working on it. Not me, but a lot of people are actually working on it. And there are a lot of clinical trials now and kind of toward this idea. So this technology is coming along. Our technology is coming along. So I say qualified maybe. Um, we do need to get a few more dB out of our system for that to, to work, but it's, it's, not, it's not crazy. Okay, so I'll finish up. So th this is my lab uh, at Northeastern. As I say, uh, these are people who have worked on this project and a few others, collaborators, um, Irene and, and Charles for this project, for sure. And then funding from the, the NIH in the States has, has allowed this to progress. So, okay, thank you very much.